Welcome everyone to this Science Business Data Rules webinar. Uh, the topic today is uh, artificial intelligence, who is liable? Uh, this webinar is a product of our data rules group, which is run by a steering committee representing leading companies and academic institutions, as well as the OECD. Now, the idea today is we're going to explore how to build confidence and trust in artificial intelligence systems. In particular, we're going to consider that topic through the lens of liability, i.e. who will be responsible if and when the software offers poor advice or makes a bad decision. We've got a, a great panel of speakers here that literally spans the globe. And with that in mind, we're going to examine the extent to which uh, we can build an international consensus on this topic and create some kind of uh, globally consistent view of how AI uh, should be regulated and um, uh, monitored, essentially. Uh, in particular, we're going to look at whether the EU's AI legislation, which is a work in progress right now, uh, will be aligned with thinking in uh, East Asia and North America. So we've divided the webinar into two segments. Uh, with lead speakers in each segment. And we'll leave some time for audience Q&A at the end of each segment. Uh, the members of our steering committee will be able to ask questions directly. They can switch on their camera and uh, ask a question during that segment. I, I'll moderate that discussion, however. So um, yeah, please uh, wait until you're invited to speak. Um, other participants can post questions through the chat function and uh, we'll look out for those and uh, take those where we can. Note that the webinar is recorded and it's very much on the record. Uh, the recording itself will be published after the event and will be available for, uh, to uh, replay or rewatch. And uh, we'll also publish an article as Science Business summarizing the main takeaways from the uh, discussion today. So um, if I could ask everyone who isn't speaking to stay on mute, just to uh, reduce the background noise as much as possible. Uh, we're gonna begin with uh, segment one, uh, which is uh, looking at AI in a, an advisory role. So this is where AI is making recommendations, uh, but ultimately human beings are making the, the final decision. So the question here really is, uh, how much regulatory intervention, if any, is required in this context where uh, the software is essentially playing this advisory recommendation role. Uh, I'm going to invite each of the lead speakers to make three or four minutes of opening remarks before we then get into a discussion. So the speakers, the lead speakers in segment one are Yanis Tolias. He's a legal officer at DG Sante from the European Commission. And we have Jack Quee. Uh, he's a professor and research director at the Department of Communications and New Media at the National University of Singapore. And we have Elizabeth Krosik, who is Head of Government Affairs for the EU for Relics, and Eva Stamhaus, he's a Senior Fellow at the Jean Monnet Centre of Excellence Digital Governance at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. So thank you to each of those speakers for joining us, and uh, thank you in advance for your, your insights. Uh, we're going to start uh, by hearing from Yanis, who can set the scene by giving us uh, the European Commission's perspective on this topic. Yanis, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, David, for the introduction. Uh, as you mentioned, I come from uh, working in DDG Sante, which is the Directorate General in the Commission working for healthcare. So we look at artificial intelligence specifically in the area of healthcare, at least in our uh, team. Of course, there is more teams in the Commission who look at AI more general. Uh, just to map you a bit what is happening at uh, legal framework level uh, within the commission, uh, probably the, uh, the first piece of AI regulation that we will see, it will be a horizontal regulation. Maybe you have, read, uh, you have read about it, that should be coming in the next few months. That will be regulating AI. Develop, deployment of AI, use of AI, and so on. We'll see exactly how, what shape it takes. Now at liability level, the concrete at the moment legal uh, framework we have at the EU level, in addition, of course, to the member states legal frameworks is the products liability directive. So that's the one which is in force. And 
in principle, uh, applicable also to AI uh, technologies. Now, at the same time now, with liability work is in progress in contrast to the AI regulation, as I said, which will be coming out uh, soon. At the liability stage, we are more work in progress. We'll see results within the next year, I would say. So whatever I say now, it's rather also personal opinions or even stuff coming from my uh, personal research. Um, and as I said, I will be talking specifically of AI in the area of healthcare. Now, uh, just to mention three, I divided my kind of first introductory talk into three, into three parts. The first one, just to understand how AI would be or is deployed in healthcare, because that could also have specific implications, liability implications or other implications. Sometimes I would say it's misconceived that we perceive AI in healthcare as being robotic, performing autonomously operations. This is not yet there. I don't see it soon coming there because it will have different legal implications. What we rather see is AI, which provides, as you said in your introductory remarks, AI providing information to a human being, in our case, the healthcare professional, and then the healthcare professional is then acting on that information. Of course, at this stage, you may, or one may ask what is new there, because already the healthcare professional was receiving a lot of information by digital technologies or other technologies and acting on that information. So why all the fuss about AI, uh, since it's another piece of information? There, I think, of course, I don't have the time to get into more details, uh, but you can read a paper, actually, I have written on that one, which is published on the uh, New York University website, and you can find it there. One of the fundamental things uh, I find in my research there is the fact that AI, for the first time, it enters into a domain that it used to be reserved for human uh, decision making. So it was usually the doctor or a human, if you want, deciding that part of, uh, of, uh, of, of treatment or of diagnosis or of management of the patient. And the AI now enters into that part. How does it do it? It does it through more or less the same way like a human doctor would have done it. But I think that's kind of the important part. And that's the part where the AI could come even with a different decision than the doctor. And we may have two conflicting decisions and then something needs to be followed. So I think in, at least in the area of healthcare, I think that's one of the fundamental issues with legal implications. Now, the second part of my, of my introductory comments is about how do we ensure, and also the, sub, the theme of the workshop, how do we ensure that this decision-making by the AI is trustable and uh, provides confidence and it should be or not followed. Here we have two kind of world in general, not just AI, we have two kind of worlds here. What we refer sometimes is the ex-ante world of legal frameworks and the exposed one. The ex-ante one is like the medical devices regulation. Something needs to be fulfilled before it's in the market, on the market. It could be also the new AI regulation. It will be in this ex-ante world, things that they need to be followed. The exposed world, usually we refer to liability issues. Sometimes there is, I would say, at least in my opinion, the misconception or saying that the ex-ante world is about safety and the exposed world is about compensation. I think both worlds, they should be communicating with each other. They are affecting each other. And at the end of the day, the objective of both worlds should be the theme of your conference or your workshop, providing trust and confidence. And both systems, both legal frameworks could be in a way adapted or developed in providing exactly that. And the third part about the, um, the AI, specifically the area of healthcare. Do we have any particularities in the area of healthcare that AI could have implications on and hence liability? I will just mention two, three, and then we can come back to them. 
I think the most important, and again, this comes from my research, is that we see in the area of healthcare a new relationship being formed between the AI, the uh, healthcare professional, and the patient. So with this, we see this new triangular, if you want, relationship being formed. And I think that's a bit the focus of what we look at also of how to strike the right balances, the, li the right liability even balances, if you want, to ensure that that triangle is working how it should be working. Uh, also in the area of healthcare, we may have different con a, a patient expectations compared to other consumer expectations, and I can come back to it. Also something that you mentioned, also explainability in your conference points. Sometimes uh, we have been perceiving, and, and I still believe that explainability, especially in healthcare, is very important. However, in recent research, it has been found out that even explainable models providing information to the physician, sometimes the physician over trusts the explanation, follows the explanation, even if the explanation is not really correct. So we can see that explain explainability, which we thought at some point, it could be even a panacea, it could even present new challenges. Uh, okay, I stop here and then I can come to the, next, the rest of the points later. Okay, thanks. No, thanks, Janice. I mean, that's an interesting point about the fact that explainability can actually potentially build false trust and uh, could take us in the wrong direction. But yeah, let, let's come back to that. Uh, I'm going to uh, hand over now to Jack to get a view from East Asia and how uh, policymakers over there are thinking about this issue and whether and how and whether to regulate AI in, a, in an advisory role. Jack, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you for uh, having me. And uh, I, I'd like to start by saying I, uh, even though I come from uh, different parts of the world, but I, my, my thinking is actually quite, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, in consistency with what uh, Yen Notes has said. Okay, but although my work as a university professor, we work on different sectors rather than just uh, healthcare. But uh, 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 we are academics, okay, and uh, we look at uh, you know uh, different kind of AI systems. And uh, uh, to echo what uh, Yenos just said, I think uh, the very fundamental basics is to categorize okay AI system into two types. Okay, ba AI basically they use machine learning, right? And one is called usually we call it uh, supervised machine learning. The other is called unsupervised machine learning. Unsupervised means okay, there's little okay when when the algorithms are trained, they they learn it's like alpha go, right? So that's the unsupervised. Okay, so the supervised by definition it means it depends on the human trainer. Okay, for the machine learning. Okay, so the the intervention is a must. Okay, for supervised. Okay, so 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 that uh, goes right. The liability okay goes to the trainer. To the people, but even to unsupervised. Okay, well, for example, we worked with uh, uh, online recommendation music system. Okay, you said you know we're, okay, but we, we have to be very careful when they are applied to real world social. Okay, such as healthcare. Okay, so th this is where their life and death matters. Okay, but then what about online entertainment system? Okay, even for that, it, it is quite you know i worked with my colleagues and uh, uh, students phd students some of them are actually phd in musicology okay and uh, just a few days we can design a system to uh, what we, we call this algorithmic auditing okay which online recommendation system would give uh, more egalitarian opportunities for independent musicians to be heard Okay, even though the system itself is using unsupervised machine learning, but we can actually uh, use, okay, uh, uh, I, th I think in that case, it's not just uh, 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 exante or uh, uh, exposed, it's because these are real time, okay, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, big data, right? So you have to do, you can do, we can do continuous, okay, whether the system claims, okay, 
to create more opportunities? Or you know, uh, which one deals better? Uh, you know, uh, like YouTube is more egalitarian than uh, Spotify, for example. We we that that's what we got, and it can still be better. Okay, so this is uh, where uh, I would like to uh, echo. Okay, you know, just use uh, if we were using we we're talking about supervised machine learning, then. Of course, okay. The 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 supervisor, human beings, need to take liability. If it's unsupervised, okay, then there's always okay a uh, 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 necessity to assess okay the the social, cultural, uh, uh, political, and economic effects of those uh, unsupervised uh, systems. And the trend we are seeing, you know, in uh, uh, East Asia, for example, China, food delivery. Okay, used to be uh, we interview food delivery platforms. The engineers say we use unsupervised, we cannot intervene. Okay, but last year we had a, you know, because of COVID. Okay, actually before COVID there were already lots of uh, protests among food delivery, you know, couriers. Okay, in China, and uh, in recent months there are even more suicides. Okay, so now the uh, the um, uh, some of them set themselves, some of the workers set themselves on fire, for example. Okay, and uh, uh, because of super exploitation, uh, uh, it's the same. Okay, uh, 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 wage uh, rares. Okay, and uh, so uh, so the uh, the unsupervised system, such as food delivery. Okay, many other systems as well. We see that in news. Okay, in uh, 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 right hailing. Uh, you know, uh, right hailing. Okay, there's a trend for unsupervised system to become supervised. Okay, in the, the news headlines used to used to say we, we just follow the big data, but now the Communist Party is saying you have to put you know uh, news about Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping, on top. You cannot say we are using unsupervised. Okay, so there's so so this is where so if you know, on the 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 realm for unsupervised machine learning, okay, as we see in the past years, especially since pandemic, has been dramatically shrinking. Okay, so there's uh, the the old, you know, the the yes, the the real the for unsupervised like uh, AlphaGo, they may continue, okay, to enjoy their relative, right, autonomy, okay, but they are not uh, used to affect the real person's lives. Okay, so that's uh, that's where uh, I think uh, we need we really need to discuss, okay, uh, uh, who makes the rules, how the rules are evaluated, and how they can be improved. So in uh, in Asia, okay, and um, here we we, we uh, uh, not only you know we are working with some of the largest okay uh, digital economies of the world, but also on the cutting edge of uh, uh, automation, right? And uh, 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 not just uh, the robotics from Japan, okay, after World War II, but actually if we look at uh, 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 historian historical work like Andrew Liu's uh, you know uh, new book from last year. Uh, actually, uh, tea making, okay, uh, making of breakfast tea, okay, in India was automated, okay, and the, and the, and their continuation, you know, between because Asia is the uh, where we see lots of the world's most uh, labor intensive production, but uh, uh, from Andrew Liu's uh, argument, you know, this uh, labor intensive production is actually a necessary precursor for the imagination and deployment of AI systems, okay. You know, uh, 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 this this dates back to the 19th century. So here, uh, this is where my perspective would I would like to bring in. It's not just Asian, but also from a perspective of digital labor. Okay, my work actually focuses on how the working class okay uh, uh, deal with uh, uh, technology. Okay, not only uh, uh, accept whatever the capital or the government impose on them, but also to resist. But also to uh, innovate. Okay, in uh, in the Chinese factory zones, you know, we we date the we call them the uh, cyber war ambush of uh, factory workers. Okay, with uh, 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 big uh, you know capitalist bosses. Okay, back to uh, two thousand and nine, right? And uh, uh, and so here I'd like to bring in uh, to a more global perspective. First is really bring in more class analysis. Okay, where we see innovation not only coming from the resourceful and the powerful labs of uh, multinational corporations or the military, but actually coming uh, innovations, okay, including innovations in ways to regulate AI should also come, and they are indeed also coming from the existential crisis of the working class, okay, in Asia. And uh, that's one point. Another point I just want to end up is that we in Asia we are we are also quite different from Europe is because of our 
you know, uh, rampant and uh, uh, um, oppressive authoritarianism. Okay, that are also on the cutting edge. So we need to always take this as a, this is a very important backdrop. Okay, when we talk about uh, uh, okay, but people who are innovating, okay, for existential crisis, it's not only recession and pandemic, but also you know the the authoritarian states. Okay, as the as the backdrop. So so here I I'd like to uh, uh, to come back to the question that David posed as who should be liable, who should make decision about the rules, the matrix. I think it should uh, go to the uh, diverse data publics. Okay, including working class uh, uh, innovators as publics. Okay, in Asia, as much as I know in Europe and uh, uh, North America, okay, there are also the uh, global movement of platform cooperatives. Okay, I, I'm a, uh, you know, one of one member of the uh, platform co-op. These are digital platforms, okay, using AI, but they are owned and managed democratically, one member, one vote by the working class. No, so I just want to uh, stop here. And the, the rules is really up to the working people, okay, whose livelihood are at stake. Okay, we, we need to depend, uh, my bet is we'd better depend on them rather than on the big corporation or bureaucracy. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. Uh, you've given it, actually, you've covered a lot of ground there and you've given a nice trailer for a future webinar in which we're, we're going to look at data inequalities, actually, and uh, the disparities that, uh, where this technology is going. So, but thank you for that. Another interesting point, I think, was you suggested unsupervised learning there's a shift away from that um, that's interesting because it obviously has implications for innovation and and um, how you essentially evolve these systems going forward but we'll we'll come back to that theme let me now uh, thank you jack let me now turn to elizabeth to uh, get some opening remarks from her and uh, we'll, uh, we'll come back to some of these questions later Thank you, thank you, David. Um, I have to say, in this uh, this group of panelists, I, I I am very humbled. I am not a researcher. I am not at a university. I am a mere ex lawyer, uh, but working for uh, for Relex. Um, I'm just going to just spend thirty seconds, um, just so that you know what Relex is, because I'm not sure that everyone will know. But we are a data analytics company. It's a public company, but we were born and rooted in Europe. We have a global reach. And we increasingly use AI in every market in which we serve. And going back to Yamas's point, we tend to use it, we use AI to support people in their decision making. So, for example, we use AI to help find missing children, to help stop fraud, and uh, notably uh, in connection with Yamas, to help clinicians make decisions. And in that sense, we're both an operator and a developer, developer of AI technologies. Uh, we invest well, either about 1.2, 1.3 billion euros annually on, in technology, and a third of our, uh, our, our people are technologists, so about 9,000 technologists, many of which are employed in Europe. And I just want to emphasize that we support machine uh, decision making. So our tools and our products do not replace the decision making. And in that sense, I suppose I would say this AI is not that different to any other product or technology. And I think sometimes we, we are in danger of treating AI as a thing in itself, as opposed to a more neutral technology that can be used for good and of course for not so good. And coming back to the trust point, you know, fear of new technology is not new. I was, uh, I was looking for, for examples um, of, uh, of people's fear of new, new things. Uh, in the 1500s, for example, coffee was considered to induce a form of drunkenness, so it was dangerous. Um, and when the telephone was invented, people feared it would give them electric shocks and some preachers warned it was the instrument of the devil. Um, uh, so, you know, our nervousness about new technologies and new things, not new. Um, and I think both the speakers have said uh, that when we're discussing liability, we need to put it in the broader context of trust. And I think many of our discussions flow exactly from that. And ultimately, if a technology doesn't feel trustworthy, citizens fear it and won't give it a license to operate. Um, and we can all remember what happened with GMOs. Specifically on liability, uh, I would agree again with Janos, it's not a new concept and there are many pieces of legislation that cover liability, whether it's product, say liability, consumer protection, and so on. So 
in the view of relics, uh, we don't think that AI justifies a shift to what I guess I would call the universal AI liability regulatory approach. <laughs> um, every class of application needs to be considered by policymakers, and only those AI technologies that truly pose societal concerns and give rise to real risk of harm um, within the current legal system, we think, or, or not managed within the current legal system, we think should be specifically regulated. And of course, we're very happy to see the details and careful work commissioned by the Commission on the scope for using the existing regime uh, with suitable incremental adjustments. Harmonization beyond, say, the product liability directive that's been mentioned could help. And I should note here, the role the contracts have in any liability discussion. So many issues can be and are covered by contractual terms and ultimately by insurance. I would say in a market economy, ultimately it is the market that decides. So if products are of poor quality, they won't be used. Um, for companies, it's a reputational is issue, which is why Relex considers itself to be responsible and a very careful developer of our products. At the same time, I end by saying, I think we do need more positive support for AI getting to market. The EU won't create an open strategic autonomy unless it commits to being an early adopter and broad user of the best technologies that are on offer and that will be created. I think that probably is enough for my opening remarks. Thank you. Great, thanks Elizabeth. We'll come back to some of those points, particularly around the questions around uh, regulation and versus uh, innovation, that tension there potentially. Uh, let me welcome our final speaker, that's uh, Evert Stamhouse. Uh, Evert um, is uh, a legal expert uh, and does a lot of work in this area, so hopefully uh, he will pinpoint some of the issues we should be uh, discussing today. Evert, the uh, floor is yours. I'm working on sharing my screen. Thank you very much, David, for having me. Um, I just have to click a couple of buttons here uh, so that Everything goes according to plan. Thank you so much. Well, I'm just going over a couple of slides and I'll try not to repeat what others already have said. I share their doubts whether, let's say, a, a, a regulation fully um, uh, attached to a specific a technology like AI is um, uh, maybe not systematically sound and not responsive and interactive enough. I just, uh, my first slide is about uh, some basic tenets for appropriate normative framework with regard to any technological uh, development. Um, and um, um, the second bullet refers to what Elizabeth just said and what Johannes already has referred to earlier. We seriously doubt whether, the, um, let's say, a specific horizontal regulation of the technology in itself were warrants, uh, sufficient, uh, is sufficiently warranted and is able to take into account the all, let's say, the big variety of uh, circumstances and interest in specific sectors. Um, um, of course, uh, regulation, this is the lawyer speaking, uh, uh, regulation should be systematically sound. We have a couple of comments on the proposed regulation of the European Parliament later on, um, and also should have substantive results, so it should really have an impact on recognized actors, so either to humans and corporations, or if you want to have it an impact on, on the machines itself or the systems itself, you should then recognize them as actors. Of course, the economic objective of tort law is very important for legal policy making. We are talking here about, let's say, ex ante thinking about what should happen ex post, right? So, uh, because liability is an exposed consequence, but the distribution or allocation of liability is something that you consider ex ante. So, also in view of certain scenarios that might happen. And the purposes are quite clear. I think everyone will share them. You should uh, offer compensation if there is any harm. And the compensation is very important for the trust that the, the wider public might have in a specific technology, because as soon as it is, it becomes known that you may ha suffer harm from a technology, but your harm is not covered, then a technology may be shied away from. Of course, th this implies uh, the various instruments, and I've shown them here. You can have insurance, you can have various liability regimes, you can have shifts of burden of proof, you can have uh, strict liability regimes, all kinds of varieties in the legal toolbox with which you can sort of secure fair compensation and fair rebalancing. Secondly, and this is more where you, let's say, focus with your liability allocation um, uh, regime uh, on the professional. So I think here again, I very much subscribe what others have said about trust, but I think in effect also for the legal policy decisions, you have to make a distinction between trust with the wider public and trust with the professionals, because we believe that the effects will be different. 
liability allocation can have um, a, a detrimental effect uh, and not being deterrent enough if you uh, aim your liability on uh, actors that do not have the uh, level of control that will, let's say, lead to harm reduction. Because optimal level of harm is the, is, is the, is the economic lingo, but of course we mean the optimal reduction of harm. And of course, preventing negative side effects. So, um, and if you combine the two, then you will come at a point where you will have, uh, let's say, a liability regime that leads to totally ignore, um, totally, uh, let's say, neglect of a certain specific innovation by the professionals. For AI systems, and particularly, let's say, the growing autonomy uh, AI systems, um, whether they are supportive or decisive, because I. I have a bit of a doubt regarding that the difference between the two, but I think for, for us speakers, but not maybe for all members of the audience, you can sort of make a division into the three effects. And we follow here um, Gunter Teubner in his, uh, in his uh, groundbreaking work. You have this sort of growing autonomy, which leads to an uh, overstretch of uh, liability, of, of incumbent liability regimes. Um, you uh, see association effects where man and machine work together in a specific context, but it is unclear what the machine has learned from man and what man has learned from the machine. So the, where the interaction becomes part of the, um, of the improvement or the, of the, or the change of the workings of the system. And uh, finally, the network effects where systems are connected and self-connecting with each other. This is of course a bit ex ante thinking, but not, let's say, if you have a look at the, at, at the, at the AI discourse, not uh, so imaginary. Um, uh, I think we can agree on that. The liability regime that the EP resolution has designed, um, had, has adopted in a resolution, shows, uh, uh, let's say, various dimensions. And I wanted just to show it's, of course, worth a full paper or two papers or maybe even a book to, to go over it all. But you can see here that the, the, the regime is diverse in risk. So you have, you allocate a certain risk to sectors and use high risk sectors and high risk use and low risk sectors or, or low risk use. That is uh, the horizontal and the vertical uh, distribution is then between various roles. And the new role that the EP comes up with is the operator devised in a front end and a back end operator. And they are then different than the user and the producer. It takes too much time to explain it all, but it, you see a diversification in roles, which means a diversification in control. So this is very much, let's say, the hook on which the code hangs, the difference in control. And then you see the various uh, liability regimes shifting from, let's say, the, 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 the fault um, So here yeah, you have a, um, a, fault, a fault liability, sorry, um, where you say someone has, has a person has fallen short in his obligations towards a, a consumer, a patient, um, and whatever, uh, whatever uh, a person has suffered harm. Whereas strict liability means when the liability, of, when the harm occurs and the causation is there, you are liable, whatever fault or less of fault you have. But this is sort of, this is the distribution mechanism that uh, EP thinks on. And uh, we come with a couple of critiques with regard to this uh, approach. First of all, we think this resolution, so this, um, this division of roles, um, is not sufficiently close to or does not match the subject matter. We doubt whether running AI systems can be devised in a product, uh, uh, let, let's say a, 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 an operator and a user, because in the liability regime, if you approach it from the liability angle, you see, as uh, Johannes already referred to, you have product liability, where a service liability is exempted from, where software has a very delicate position in the product liability uh, regulations, and where the human, it has then also a separate liability, particularly if you think about specific professional uh, uh, contexts like medical malpractice, which is a totally different liability regime than the more general liability regime that you have. And uh, secondly, our criticism, I already referred to that, is about the supposed level of control for the operators, which we think is an unsafe basis to make a distinction. And the distinct, clear distinctions in, in, in the legal angle, the clear distinctions help courts to resolve conflicts over harm and harm compensation. And of course, ex ante uh, helps insurance companies and, and actors to, to, uh, to make a, a clear calculation of risks. 
We uh, secondly think that the deterrent effect is not on the actor with control, particularly in the in, in systems that have growing autonomy, where the actor um, that is supposed to have control, either the operator or uh, to some extent the user, um, uh, actually will not have the level of control that you would expect if you apply the incumbent liability uh, principles. As a result of that, we think that the, the strict liability regime that, I ref that is referred to here, you see for the operators, the strict liability in the high risk um, um, uh, sectors, for example, healthcare is one of the high risk sectors, then we think that the, this, this type of liability will have a chilling effect on innovations, so that the actual operators or users will shy away from the technology, which is a negative side effect. And we think in the end of the day, but we'll have maybe a discussion later on, about more innovative way of governing this type of risk-taking behavior. Thank you so much. Here I will limit my introductory remarks. Great, thanks, Emma. We're actually we are running out of time in this segment. So I, what I'm going to do is just ask a brief question to each of you. Hopefully, leave time for a couple of uh, audience uh, uh, questions after that, or we can come to some audience questions at the end. But uh, just a quick follow-up question for Yanis first. Um, I mean, you mentioned this uh, issue around explainability and whether that potentially builds false confidence or false trust. So, Yanis, do you think explainability should be a requirement with AI systems or should it just not be a requirement? Is it a sort of red herring, for want of a better word? Uh, thank you, David. Yeah, just also make a quick uh, clarification. Uh, I, I said that the, the existing now legal framework we have is a product's liability, which could be in principle be applicable to every product, including AI in principle. However, okay, that is the work is ongoing and I'm not saying there should be no other liability regimes adopted or how it should develop or how it should evolve. I rather uh, explain some of the challenges in a way. Now exactly what form these challenges could be addressed I don't know myself, and as I said, this is ongoing work in the Commission as to whether we need a horizontal framework or some adaptations of the product liability and or combinations of different systems and so on. But as I, but just to clarify that, I don't say or I don't have now a specific uh, position or there is no Commission position at the moment as to how these things should be, uh, uh, how these challenges should be addressed but I'm just laying down the challenges. Now, with regard to explainability, uh, of course, in my research, I also, and you can find this, I said this paper and, and see, I very much favor explainability, especially in healthcare. And I was arguing even in that paper that explainability could be providing certain, uh, uh, even certain clarifications two challenges that we see in medicine in particular. Uh, however, as I also said, it should not be perceived as a panacea for resolving all the issues. So for me, and again, this comes from my research, is that I think the most interesting probably thing to do is to see how maybe through the liability framework is to regulate this correlation between the AI, the physician and the patient. Because as Everett said, and I agree, and that's what I'm saying, is that different players also have different liabilities. Even now, the physician has its medical negligence. There is products liability, there is services. There is the patient who has to give their informed consent before something takes place. So this thing, this triangle somehow should work. And it could work, this triangle could, co this could work or collaborating these actors by ex ante and exposed. So the liability framework could be imposing this type of collaboration. And I think that's for me, maybe the most important, how do we best make uh, this collaboration work and would be working to the best interest of the patient, at least when it comes to healthcare. Okay, thank you. Got it, thank you, Yanis. Uh, let me just come back to clarify something with Jack. J yeah, I, I, I wanted to pick up Jack on this point you made about this shift away from unsupervised learning. Um, from your perspective, does that mean that we'll see 
you know, less dynamism, less innovation in AI going forward because everything, if everything's supervised, then it goes slower and it, it evolves in more predictable, expected ways. Well, uh, not necessarily, okay, and uh, because uh, you know, regulation to me is uh, 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 you know, or, or the supervision that we need to train. Uh, you know, algorithms, okay, these are neutral, okay, to me, you know, this, uh, you know, like it can be, sometimes if it's, it's uh, excessive regulation, then it can stifle, okay, uh, 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 innovation. And to that point, uh, in my part of the world, world, we don't even call it regulation, we call it censorship. Right. All right. And uh, so, right, but then at the, the more neutral uh, regulation, like uh, what I would give as an example is, for example, traffic regulation. In Singapore, like in the UK, we drive on the left side of the road. In China and the continental Europe, you drive on the right side. There's no right or wrong. Okay, once you have that regulation, you know, and then everyone, you know, agree on which side is the right side to drive. Okay, that actually helps innovation. Mm. Right? That helps, uh, you know, and prevents, you know, and there are other regulations of safety belt. Okay, so so proper regulation can actually okay prevent market failure you know can also you know uh, make sure okay uh, 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 sometimes okay the uh, the big brother okay or the big corporation you know may not choose the most economically and technologically efficient way okay to to structure right? because they rely on monopoly okay and so i think these are actually uh, antitrust regulation Okay, it's actually a innovation, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, incubator, right? It it actually helps to create more competition. Okay, the kind of uh, situation that uh, Elizabeth uh, described. So I I think it really we need to, uh, you know, uh, have a more uh, neutral okay uh, stance to look at regulation and see it, you know, as a wide range of things rather than just one. Okay, regulation equals manipulation. Okay, and that's something I think everyone is against, including myself. Okay, thank you, no, thank you for clarifying that, Joe. Um, yeah, Elizabeth, quick question for you. We are coming up to the second segment, but uh, I just wanted to uh, get a view on, uh, how, from a company like Relics, how much international harmonization are you looking for? I mean, is it a major problem if different regions take a different approach to this? And if that does happen, you know, what would be the implications for the private sector? Yeah, sure. And if I can actually just make two comments as well on what previous speakers have said. I think, uh, Jack, to your point about antitrust, I think that is really important. But I would ask the question, does our antitrust regulation at the moment, is it fit for purpose in this new world? I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure we yet have the right tools to really help crack this, but I agree with you, it needs to be done. And on the issue of transparency, I think that's probably a sub, uh, well, on the, yeah, it's probably um, a bit of a subset. Uh, uh, explainability is probably a subset of transparency. And we were talking a little bit about explainability. And I think one thing to maybe have in mind when we are thinking about how we deal with this is um, looking at uh, the evaluation of AI usage and, and actually you can do the same with liability as whether the end result is at least as good as and as reliable as the human made equivalent. So I think that's an important baseline. In terms of international harmonization, I mean, yes, obviously for a global company like us, it's actually very difficult when you've got very different regulation, regulatory um, thinking in different regions, because obviously what, what we do with AI, how we use the technology and the products we make transcend back borders. So whilst what I wouldn't want is a kind of global regulatory system kind of in its kind of hardened sense, I think we'd be very unlikely to get that. But the more thinking around how we collaborate, how we cooperate across the borders, how, how decision makers and regulators work together, and maybe hard regulation isn't always the way, maybe softer norms, best practice and so on. I know, you know, you'll say, well, yeah, that's a company, you would say that, wouldn't you? But I think, in an area like this where, you know, the technology doesn't respect borders, I think we need to work more closely and collaboratively um, across the globe. And I think that will help us to get this right. And, and you know, I think particularly to what Eva was talking about, you know, you, you don't want to, you don't want to make innovation so risky that you don't do it. And, and I think that we are, you know, there's always a risk. 
And actually life has a risk, you know, getting out of bed has a, has a risk. Um, and that's not to negate the importance of what AI can bring in terms of risk, but there are also great benefits as well. And I think we just need to, to be balanced on it. Okay, great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, Emma, just a very quick question for you, because I'm going to need to move to the second segment. I think we'll do the audience Q&A right at the end. But uh, Emma, I'm just curious, fr from your perspective, how easy is it to define misuse in the context of AI? Because this strikes me as a major question for a legal framework, because AI systems are supposed to evolve, they're supposed to become better and more flexible and more versatile. So should we be attempting to define misuse in a rigid way? Uh, thank you so much, David, for your question. Um, I think one of the problems that the regulation will, at, at least that the in this proposed regulation tries to overcome, is stay away from this kind of um, complex questions, which will end up in a specific uh, litigation as uh, questions of proof, by uh, attributing strict liability. Because those, so that you, if, if there is harm and causation, there is no longer the, uh, uh, the necessity to prove fault on the side of the system or on the side of the user of the system or the operator of the system. So as a result of that, you are liable as a, let's say, as responsible actor, as soon as there is harm and there is causation between your behavior and the harm. So whether you whether the system has uh, um, uh, has uh, performed badly or whether you, uh, whether the combination of factors have been performed badly, whether your response mechanisms to failure of the machine worked badly, whatever. Um, but the effect of the end, in the end of the day is when you, when the system becomes more and more unpredictable, and this is relates very much to the explainability point that we have this, uh, that the other speakers have addressed. When the system becomes more and more unpredictable, it's less and less attractive to work with this kind of system because in the end of the day, you it's hard for you to prevent, so to have the ex ante effect of your possible liability, so to prevent, and that may explain the shift. Um, uh, for various other reasons than Jack referred to, the shift to, to supervised learning, so that at least to a certain extent, you uh, um, make the system more explainable. But I think, as far as I understand the discourse, that will lead to, um, for, for, for a time, lead to stifling the developmental uh, um, uh, opportunities and potential of the unsupervised learning systems. Okay, uh, thank you, Ever. Well, that's actually, actually a very nice segue into the second segment. If the speakers from segment one can stay with us, because we'll get to audience Q&A towards the end, there could be questions for you as well. But um, the second segment, we are going to look at AI in a decision-making role, and uh, particularly the, the question of whether, um, you know, essentially, who is, who's in control when we allow the, the machines to actually uh, act on their own accord. This is more of a future-looking perspective, clearly. Uh, we've got three really good speakers on this topic. We've got Paul Nemitz, he's Principal Advisor, DG Justice and Consumers at the European Commission. Uh, Fred Popovich, he's Professor and Scientific Director at the Simon Fraser University's Big Data Initiative in, in Canada. And uh, Christopher Hankin, who is Professor of Computer Science and Co-Director of the Institute for Com uh, Security Science and Technology at the Imperial College in London. So thank you to the three of us for joining them. We're gonna follow the same format where we get a few minutes of opening remarks from each of the speakers, then we'll get into a panel discussion. And uh, I promise we will take some audience Q&A at the, uh, the end of the webinar. So without further ado, if I can turn to Paul and if he could just frame some of the, the questions that he's grappling with uh, when it comes to AI in a decision-making role. Paul, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, and uh, I'll jump right into it. Um, we have discussed in the first uh, panel um, the questions of uh, private law liability, namely when the machines do harm. But there is, of course, also a public law liability, um, and that is um, in the context of the forthcoming regulation, namely, uh, you know, the AI regulation. There will be obligations um, uh, of behavioral nature. Um, which uh, uh, are not uh, private law liability obligations. And there is, of course, already, when it comes to automated decision making, um, the rule book of uh, GDPR, which is extremely relevant here. I think um, we all need to realize that GDPR, although it doesn't mention um, AI, fully applies to AI whenever AI treats personal data. And that's, of course, the case uh, when we are in the health uh, sector. 
It is true that uh, GDPR um, contains uh, some very, very important exceptions uh, from uh, the rules of consent. Uh, for example, when it comes to uh, fighting ep epidemics, um, many people have overlooked this in the, in the COVID uh, uh, debate. Um, you know, my view is to be very blunt uh, that uh, on the basis of GDPR, we could, um, uh, you know, make uh, people uh, carry an app and, and collect uh, data from them uh, with even without their consent, because uh, that is foreseen uh, in this um, uh, regulation. If there is a law which provides uh, um, um, uh, doing this uh, in the member states or uh, in the in the EU, but um, more specifically on automated uh, decision making, uh, GDPR contains a very important uh, provision, which is Article Twenty Two. And the philosophy of this provision is that humans should never become uh, the object of machines. And uh, this is something uh, which goes back to the Enlightenment. It also goes back to the Bible. Um, you know, it is, I think, our understanding in Europe and probably all over the Western world, at least, that it's always humans which stand above the things including uh, technologies. And this is very important to maintain um, uh, into the future. And this is not small fry, which can be done away with, with token references to, you know, let's have innovation move on. Let me say something about the relationship between law and other forms of um, dealing with uh, innovative technologies. It's of course true that it's always good if uh, companies and business sectors give themselves rules. And it's also true that in the medical field, um, there's a, a history of ethics which goes back thousands of years and all this is well and good. But there are two very important reasons why I would wish that none of us talk down the law as the most noble impression of expression of democracy. First, um, we live in a world where democracy is in a crisis. And it is not a good thing if representatives of business go around and preach as if the law is a bad thing. The law is something through which democracy works. And if we want to do something against the democracy crisis in which we live, we cannot have token formulations about you know, the problems of law in general. Obviously, it is right that the law has to be proportional. It has to make sense. You know, we must have good knowledge flowing into the law. And the Commission and other European institutions, the lawmakers also in particular, are more and more relying in these very technological fields on the truthful information they receive from business. So we need a constructive attitude in business towards lawmaking. Um, and I think we have to get away from a pre avis negative about uh, uh, democratic forms of acting. But there's a second reason why law is an important tool. Because law um, is not only de democratically legitimized in contrast to you know, ethics committees deciding this or that, or self-regulation by business, but law also provides a level playing field because it is enforceable against everyone. And that is exactly the reason why also, for example, the internet industry, which was very much against any type of law, if you remember um, the declaration of the independence of cyberspace of John Perry Barlow, where he very clearly said, you know, we never want to have any law in the cyberspace. Governments and legislators have nothing to say here. Uh, this was the early music of the first um, 20 years of the internet. But today, the internet industry says very different things. I mean, read uh, the article of um, Mark Zuckerberg in the Washington Post of March last year, uh, where he says, we need laws in these four areas. And then, you know, come the four areas, which include, of course, in America, also data protection. And why is that so? Because those players, which want to do good things. And there are many in business who want to do good things. They have a problem to be able to do good things and not being undercut by the free riders 
if there is no binding law creating a level playing field. So the binding law is a very important instrument of the common market to ensure that those businesses who want to do good things are not pushed to the side by you know, the rough players who don't care so much about the ethics and who only go uh, for profits and if it is at the cost of lives. And these can be within the European Union and they come also outside the European Union. So that is why it is also in the interest of those businesses who want to do good things that we have good laws which are enforced against everyone and provide a level playing field. And we have a good law here in GDPR, just uh, to give you here the gist of things on automated processing. It's very clear that individuals in all situations, including in the medical context, can object uh, to um, automated uh, processing, which produces legal effects concerning them or similarly significantly affect him or her. And this is, I think, where we would be in the field of medical treatment. And the way um, to uh, get around this is, of course, to reach an explicit consent um, that decisions in terms of treatment are taken by the machine, which is allowed. You know, here it is foreseen that if there is an explicit consent, which means the patient is told, you know, this or that decision relating to you will be taken by this AI, that is fine. And I would trust the medical um, professional rules. Um, you know, there's a reason why we have renconologists as specialists, because, you know, they work with a complex technology. I would trust that, uh, you know, the doctors must understand the technology with which they work. If they don't understand the technology, that is um, probably a professional, professional error. So that is one element I wanted to point you to. And the other element, which goes hand in hand with this Article 22, are the related rights of information. I just scroll up here. They are um, the same in Article 13, 14, and 15 of uh, GDPR. And I'm just going to take one as an example. Please look here at Article 13, 1, F. Oh, no, uh, sorry. 13, um, 2F. 132F, we are here. Um, I hope you still see my screen. Yes. So here it is said that um, information shall be provided on the existence of automated decision making. So, you know, you have to inform the individual that a machine takes a decision, referred to in 21, 22, um, uh, which we just looked at. And at least in those cases, meaningful information about the logic involved, the significance and the envisaged consequences of such processing for the data subject. So um, these are far going um, information obligations and you have to provide uh, these informations. I would say, you know, grosso modo, this is like when you prescribe a medicine and the person uh, in, uh, who has to take the medicine gets this famous piece of paper, uh, which informs about the effect of the medicine and possible side effects and so on. You know, you need a similar type of information to your patient when there's an automated uh, decision making um, uh, involved in, in relation to treatment. Um, so, my last um, remark is on the relationship between these obligations um, uh, and private liability, um, private law liability in terms of harm. For uh, liability under GDPR, no physical or monetary or, or material harm is necessary. So uh, since this is a public law uh, obligation, and um, if there are, let's say, um, very specific issues to be dealt with in research projects, I know we are having in the audience a lot of representatives of science, business, and universities. And um, I think it is a very good idea to talk with your uh, data protection authorities about it. And let me also say, I personally regret it very much. I, at the time when we did the GDPR, I was the lead director of the commission, and we actually tried to get an empowerment through to be able to harmonize 
uh, in Europe uh, through a comitology decision on European level, the specific rules relating to the safeguards which are necessary in research projects which are cross-border. Um, and unfortunately, this uh, empowerment was uh, not given to the Commission um, uh, and member states basically, you know, they just want to decide everything on their own individually, which creates, I know, a lot of problems for cross-border um, uh, projects of research uh, in this area. Uh, and, uh, you know, please don't complain to the Commission, complain to your national ministers and your health ministers. In fact, the health ministers wanted to give the empowerment uh, to the Commission, but uh, in the end, in the overall deal, this was not possible. So. I could imagine uh, that in the future on health in particular, uh, we will have a thrust towards more harmonization of rules. And we will only get this if you engage with your national governments and you convince them that, that this would be a good thing uh, because you are interested obviously to work cross borders uh, without barriers. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Paul. Uh, there's a couple of points I'd like to come back to in the discussion there, but thank you for uh, setting the scene so ably. Um, I'm going to turn to Fred now and get a uh, perspective from North America on this, uh, this forward-looking aspect of AI in a decision-making role. So, Fred, how, uh, how is uh, the US, Canada thinking about this? Okay, well, happy to talk about that. And thanks, everyone, for setting the context. So I think I'll be able to be quite direct with my comments and put, draw on a few things there. So, yeah, to start with, I'm not a lawyer, but an AI professor, but I'm glad that we have people with legal backgrounds. But, but as a professor, I am associated with a group that collaborates with organizations, companies, and even governments on a range of real-world data-driven problems. So uh, when we think of it for like uh, intelligent systems that we have a long history on software, we have a long history of people clicking, I agree, because the choice is to use the software as is, as opposed to going without it, or, or choosing to drink coffee or use a telephone because you're willing to accept the risks of being, uh, uh, to build on some of Elizabeth's earlier comments there too. We, we know what the risks are. And that's a visibility of knowing what the risks are, or at least having people that can inform us on what those risks are. Do we cl effectively click, click though I agree by walking into a building? Well, it depends on what the task is in terms of it or, being, uh, or on what's the risk. Are we uh, becoming the object of a machine when we choose to board an aircraft? Are we accepting the aircraft as is? And it, depending, you can see quite some of these tasks, whether they're relating to medical or transportation and different things. Uh, and then at least we, with all of those things, we have a history though of risks of legal liability in that. And again, I'm not a lawyer, but from a technology point of view, this is with AI being involved, it is just the next step, the next layer of technology in terms of this. It's just that in the decision-making process, uh, how much of that decision are, what is the decision that, because a human is still making a decision. They're choosing to accept the, uh, the uh, to say that maybe the system knows better than I can. Maybe I'm willing to accept its translation of this document for the purposes I have in mind because I don't speak uh, German or some other language and I'm willing to accept this translation. With respect to this notion of uh, knowing what the risk is or just even this whole notion of visibility uh, in terms of this, we see how that has also changed over in the recent years. Like for software systems, there's already the practice of open source software, which allows visibility into the algorithms where, you know, where, where smart people can look at it and you're willing to trust their view on it. But we have to remember that software is a combination of algorithms and data. And we've already talked about these issues earlier today. And in terms of that data, is it labeled data? Are we dealing with supervised machine learning tasks, unsupervised machine learning tasks? And so we have to take a look. I think it's an important, um, I, if you wanted to pick up one important aspect of this right now, I think uh, uh, making sure that we are distinguishing and taking a look at the data issues and the algorithmic issues. And we've already begun to see some of these things where there are uh, there's technical tools already. We've seen advances for identifying and mitigating bias in AI algorithms. And there's a lot of exciting work still to be done there. Like there's this whole, even in terms of some of the evaluation functions, are there biases in there? You know, fair K means was only published recently. So one of the options that we have is really for taking a look at breaking things down in terms of uh, on a, taking a look at the algorithmic aspects and taking a look at the data aspects. From the point of view of where we're going in the future, and, and uh, I appreciate our, my fellows, I won't go into the details of some of the other 
things that our, my colleagues have spoken about there. From the Canadian perspective, uh, it was actually um, back in, I guess it was probably about 2019 that the directive on automated decision-making came out in terms of that, where the government was looking to utilize AI to make or to assist in making administrative decisions to improve service delivery. So the government and the whole notion of that was the government was committed to do things in a manner that was uh, dealing with transparency, accountability, legality, procedural frame, uh, fairness, and, and so on. And uh, in terms of that, they've also then helped create questionnaires, for instance, like the notion of the algorithmic impact assessment to help organizations and people assess and mitigate the risks associated with deploying an automated decision system. And uh, there's a range of uh, guidelines actually all around the world in countries. And this is the important thing of it as, you know, as new th guidelines are put, being put in place, people with the visibility, you know, building on other people's guidelines, building on other people's uh, not only the technical approaches, you know, like we all agree that we have to critically evaluate systems, but also taking a look at non-technical approaches where we're documenting the processes and decisions made throughout, like say the design pipeline from data collection to result communication and or uh, action that you're taking. So ultimately there, uh, just to, to, to wrap up briefly by raising some of the issues from uh, my colleagues earlier, we also talked about that uh, the issue in terms of reproducibility. Well, this is some of the thing is humans won't necessarily make the same decision at the different points in time because something has changed. Time has changed. We've become wiser. It's not just about data-driven approaches. It's about information-driven approaches, knowledge-driven approaches, and maybe wisdom-driven approaches in terms of this. So I think that really uh, dealing with this notion of the balance between liability and innovation, I think we can support both through openness and transparency. And in terms of privacy, like allowing, uh, thinking about the appropriate flow of information and not, uh, aside from, and not just the information itself. So with that context, I wanted to add those few things there. And I know it's a lot of information and I'm really uh, keen to get some questions from the audience as well. So I will pass it back to you, David, so you can go on to our next speaker there. Great, thanks, Fred. There is a couple of things I'd like to drill down on, but we'll come back to that. Uh, thank you again. So we're gonna, fa our final speaker today is uh, Chris Hankin. He's gonna uh, give us a view from a, a very much uh, uh, the, the perspective of computer science of this issue. So Chris, uh, the floor is yours. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks, David, for that uh, introduction. Um, Fred uh, said a lot of things which, which I've got in my notes here as well, so I'll try to be relatively brief. Uh, I was going to start just by sort of giving an idea of the sort of research that I do, which is, is relevant to this, this area. And the two main areas that I've been looking at are digital epidemiology, which is using social media, public health data, and national and regional news sources to, to track disease spread. And the other is applications of machine learning in cybersecurity. And uh, in the latter, we use both uh, um, machine learning to detect attacks, but also there's been a lot of focus uh, recently on protecting machine learn learning algorithms from attack. Uh, the area of uh, adversarial machine learning, which, which uh, in part, um, focuses on poisoning of data sources at uh, this point that uh, Fred just made about the information and the data being as important as the algorithms. Uh, but the other aspect of that is evasion attacks where attackers try to um, subvert the classification processes that the machine learning algorithms are trying to implement. I should, should say fairly near the outset that, that I'm speaking partly on behalf of the Association for Computing Machinery in making this presentation. Uh, the ACM is the world's largest educational and scientific computing society, if you haven't met it before. Uh, I'm the immediate past chair of the ACM Europe Council and currently lead uh, their technology policy uh, committee. Um, and uh, that will become relevant uh, towards the end of my brief uh, overview. Um, uh, before I get to that, uh, I, I've had a look around at what other organisations have been saying uh, recently about um, principles that should um, guide our thinking about trustworthy artificial intelligence and machine learning. And uh, I didn't look as far afield as Singapore and North America, but the EU, of course, has had the high level expert group on AI 
uh, there's the Institute for Ethical AI in Europe and the ACM has also been active in this area, both in the US actually and in Europe. And there's some commonality across the principles that, that are being proposed. And I think we've heard some of these words already during the course of today, uh, but uh, the four which come up time and time again, a uh, human agency and oversight of what, <clears throat> of what these systems are doing, uh, explainability, which I don't think is really about supervised versus unsupervised. I would say that they can both be equally inexplicable in the sorts of things which they, that they advise. Uh, basically in unsupervised, the uh, um, explanation is, is built into the reward system and so on that, that guides the, um, the learning process. And that can be embedded in algorithms. So it's not very explicit necessarily. And uh, in supervised learning, um, often, uh, particularly if you're using neural net technology, there are many different layers to the neural network. Uh, and it's very difficult to extract why a particular decision might be being suggested. So, uh, so I think explainability is a big research challenge. It's certainly been a big research challenge in North America with DARPA investing a lot of money into a project called XAI, XAI which is about explainable artificial intelligence. And then the other two, two issues that come up repeatedly are accountability on behalf of the people uh, using these systems, which involves a, a certain amount of risk management and so on, and, and auditability um, of, of, uh, of these systems. So the ACM Europe Council in 2018 published a white paper which was entitled When Computers Decide and was specifically looking at automated decision making systems and how we should think about those going forward. Uh, we made 10 recommendations. I'm not going to go through them all. Your, uh, David will be very pleased to hear, but I just wanted to pick out three, which I think are, are very relevant to the things which have come up in the earlier discussion today. The first was about establishing means, measures and standards to assure that automated decision systems are, are fair. So fairness maybe is the key point there. And this has to be a multi-stakeholder discussion, I think. And uh, today's workshop is maybe the start of that. Uh, but also uh, it does involve uh, a strong focus in the research community on this question of explainability for some of the reasons I've mentioned a little earlier. Uh, the second is about making sure that ethics are there at the front. And it's actually even uh, recommending that uh, member states in the European Union should consider the development of ethics committees for automated decision making in the same way that we already have ethics committees for health and biology. Um, and then the third recommendation was about establishing clear legal responsibilities for automated decision makings use and impacts. And I guess that's uh, uh, what we've been discussing all the way through today's workshop. Uh, but I particularly wanted to highlight something which I think is related to an issue that Fred was pointing towards, which is that if you buy software today, you often sign off to agree to agree uh, the terms of using that software. And those terms will include a blanket disclaimer of liabilities attached to, uh, attached to the use of that software. And maybe that's something we need to seriously revisit in the context of uh, uh, AI-based systems and automated decision-making systems. That's no longer uh, particularly uh, appropriate for those types of systems. So uh, basically what I'd like to finish this very brief sort of opening remarks with is, is just to commend our paper, When Computers Decide to You. It's available from the acm.org website. Um, and uh, our, our intention there was to promote a more mature conversation about the role of AI in decision-making. And that should be underpinned by an education program as much as anything else. I think all the stakeholders need to understand at least to some level what's being discussed. So that's right away from schools through to uh, uh, universities and the general public. And I look forward to an interesting discussion in the rest of the workshop. Thank you. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, I, I, there is uh, audience questions coming in, so I want to leave time for those. But I'm going to ask each of you just a quick follow up question, partly for the sake of clarity, actually. But if I can start with you, Paul, I think one of the things uh, um, is interesting in the context of GDPR PR, is the uh, this concept of explicit consent and the extent to which consumers can 
give informed or knowledgeable consent in the context of an AI uh, system. Um, if we're asking for explicit consent, do we have to be sure that the, the consumer understands what the system is capable of and what it's actually doing? I know that's a big question, but if you give me a fairly brief answer, <laughs> that would be helpful. Yeah, in the same way, uh, I would say, you know, let's compare it to, to the medicine BIPAC uh, piece of paper. You know, there the expectation in law is also that the medicine BIPAC piece of paper, even if the formula of the medicine is very complex, explains in a meaningful and understandable way what does this medicine do good and what are the risks. And I think the same level of uh, information is... Um, uh, required uh, when it comes to asking for free and informed consent under GDPR. And honestly, I think this is doable. And uh, the related industries, you know, who have worked uh, with in, in medicine, uh, they will know that doctors will ask a lot more questions than the patient. Paul, but just a quick follow-up to, uh, to Fred's point. If the uh, decision is between using the system and not having any any other option? In other words, a binary decision. Even if a consumer's got some doubts, aren't, aren't they likely to just tick the box? Well, this is not about ticking the box. This is about, uh, you know, you're in hospital or in the medical treatment. And, uh, you know, normally, uh, um, you know, a doctor will also explain to you a little bit how he's treating it. So, I mean, uh, you know, let's not play uh, down this need that we need people to be, to, to be exercising their own judgment here. You know, we don't want a nanny state, that's the loved argument of business against a law which protects people. But surely we don't also, also, also want a legal situation where the patient just has nothing to ask and nothing to say. And, you know, I don't think we're asking here for too much. We're just asking that, um, you know, people understand what is happening to them okay. as far as possible. Yeah, okay, no, that's clear. Thank you, Paul. Um, Fred, just a quick follow-up for you. I mean, you talked about the importance of openness and transparency. So I'm just wondering what you think about the idea of allowing uh, third parties or making it mandatory even for third parties to inspect AI systems and to actually check them, some kind of mandatory auditing of let's say high risk ai systems or systems that you know could cause harm in some way is, is that an approach you would advocate well in terms of this we're taking a look at what's already been done out there for engineering like when we have when we have bridges are being built we have all sorts of you know inspect or even houses being built we have all sorts of inspections and things like that so i think that we have to take full uh, leverage and full uh, acknowledging that yes, there's a cost associated with it uh, for the, the highly dependent on the task. I have, I think that it is a completely appropriate for many tasks to have that kind of inspection or part of the process. And, and I, I think that in terms of granted, we don't want to stifle innovation, but you know, there's enough uh, ways that we can uh, demonstrate, you know, with proof of concepts, innovative things, and then just be say, uh, we want to make sure that we're uh, that based on the risk profile of things that we're doing the best and things for society. So I think there is a role for that regulation and inspection. Okay, I'm going to ask my follow-up to that to Chris, actually, because Chris, uh, that then begs the question as to if you've got a dynamic system, uh, which is evolving, which obviously AI systems are dynamic and they're evolving, how often do you inspect them? How often do you check that they're actually still doing the job they were intended to do? Uh, you know, is it practical to do that? Um, well, that's a good question, and I think we have real challenges in actually um, conducting those inspections because uh, I think the, the 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 major trend in AI at the moment is towards neural network neural network based systems, and basically I think once those are configured, it's very difficult for anyone to really unpick why uh, the algorithm works in in the way. That it actually does at any particular point in time, um, and uh, so this is my concern really, actually, about uh, uh, Article Thirteen F of the uh, uh, of, of GDPR. Uh, to quote it back to you, it, it talks about meaningful information about the logic uh, involved in rule-based systems, and I think the problem with neural network-based systems is that there isn't actually a logic as such after the training has happened. 
uh, the pacifier will work in a, in a certain way, but it's very difficult to extract the logic of that uh, decision-making process. Uh, it's easier with rule-based systems, but I think the current trend is more to use of, uh, of deep learning systems based on your network technology rather than rule-based systems. I'm just going to interject very briefly in terms of that, that I think, uh, again, with neural net systems, again, that's where I think the importance aspect of evaluating a system uh, in terms of understanding the understanding the underlying algorithm, but that, that's where the data is really important. And if, if you have appropriate data, that's where you can, where we actually have an uh, opportunity for humans to be involved in terms of the process for making sure that the data is up to date and, and so on. So I think that I, I agree with your point and explainability, I think is an important aspect of this. And I think that's why it's a great, uh, that there's research still being done in that area as well. Yes, I'd agree, agree very strongly with that. Uh, yep. Of course, it's the training data, actually, that's, yep. that's uh, the important thing. Yep. Okay, thank you both. I, I want to uh, take some of the audience questions here, which have come in from a variety of channels. But uh, one of them is, uh, how do you see uh, education on AI to the public plays a role in building trust, given the complexity of the technology? So is it essentially possible to have an effective public education system around AI, which would resolve some of these issues. Um, I'll maybe start with Paul on that because obviously you've got a consumer perspective. Can we effectively provide education on this? Yes, sure we can, but you know, I'm a great friend of saying that we have to rehabilitate knowledge and, and language uh, before we talk about you know, digital literacy. I mean, the reality is many people today come from school and they're not able to express their thoughts clearly in normal language. And um, I think it is also an illusion to think um, that uh, in the future world, uh, the natural language um, uh, you know, will lose uh, in importance. Uh, we understand the world through language. And um, I think all this discourse about trust in technology and data, uh, you know, we have to be very careful with this. Uh, my view is that the key function of democracy now and in the future is the control of technical power. And we need to maintain a critical attitude towards any type of power, whether power in government, power in private corporations or power of technology. And this is what we have to teach our children. We should not teach trust in technology. We should teach critical attitude and we should teach language in order to participate in the great debates of democracy. And uh, I think that's the challenge of the time. And then if in the, in the agenda we still have a scope, of course we have to teach modern technologies, you know, digital skills, AI, all this is good and we need public information campaigns and we need people to encourage to work with new technologies, to work in innovation, to encourage innovation. But um, let's say, um, uh, you know, um, we live in a world where power becomes more and more concentrated through business processes and through technology. And if we want to maintain a free society and we don't uh, want to be dominated by these powers, uh, we need critical attitude and participation in democratic decision making. Got it. Um, Chris or Fred, do you want to, or, or our segment one speakers as well, do you want to quickly come in on that uh, point? Could I just mention that another ACM initiative actually, well, it's not only ACM, it's all of the computing societies um, in, in Europe effectively with ACM uh, and the deans of uh, computer science schools are promoting a, a scheme called Informatics for All, which does envisage uh, treating informatics or computer science really as fundamental to education as is reading, writing and arithmetic. And, and going forward, uh, we must in this millennium be training people to be aware, at least in, in some form of um, the capabilities of computers and so on uh, as a basic part of their, uh, their education all the yeah, way through I, life. And, and that should include, I think, a more realistic assessment of what AI can do for them now. Uh, it should include things like cybersecurity as well, of course, but uh, there's a whole package of things that should be there uh, right, from the, right from the word go. I mean, our children at the ages of two and three are using iPads already. Yeah. 
that as soon as they get to school age, we ought to be uh, raising their awareness about the, this this whole area. Yeah, that data, digital literacy, and data literacy and AI. Like, be, uh, I, I typed a brief comment in terms of that. I think that I think plays an important part in terms of the uh, visibility and you know transparency of what is going on, so that the average person. But I think that what is also important in terms of this, and where I've seen a lot of uh, other organizations, whether it be universities or uh, uh, just even groups in terms of not-for-profits being involved is many people don't see how this ties into their specific need or their specific sector and things like that. So I think that one of the, there's uh, granted you can have some sort of uh, in terms of some of the, the literacy and vi uh, uh, visibility, uh, general aspects of it. But I think the real opportunity is for seeing people, how it ties into their specific job, their specific day-to-day. -day. So I think that's gonna be an important part. Okay, no, thank you. I want to just turn to a different audience. Uh, David, can I just, uh, you, yeah. you invited the panelists of the previous panel also to, yeah. to present if you yeah, like. Yeah, I was, I was actually going to put the next question to you, Evert, but uh, do you want a quick comment on this one? or? Uh... I, I think in, in, in terms of the education and the training, I think it is super relevant because of the fact that we require on the macro level democracy of, of consent and on the micro level consent. And consent without knowledge is meaningless. So I think in that way... Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the knowledge is wider than just technology or learning trust. It is about the full impact of the of the decision to which you consent, either on the macro level or on the micro level. That's what I just wanted to add. Yeah, no, thank you. It does strike me that it's somewhat polarized today. People either blindly trust technology or they don't trust it at all. <laughs> the rarely middle ground. But ever, I just want to stay with you quickly for this next question because I think you may have an answer for this. Uh, do you think the GDPR needs an amendment to explore AI-based interventions on private data for healthcare? Um, I don't, don't know if you looked in particular at that, but uh, it's a very precise question. Maybe Paul has a view on that as well. Uh, um, well, first of all, I think the, the problematic nature of the relationship in healthcare between treatment, between patient and doctor is already highlighted by the European Data Protection Board. Uh, where they have, I think, attracted attention to the fact we should study more about, let's say, the informed consent, particularly in the situation where, uh, where Fred already pointed at, wh whether you do not have an alternative. So, so in that way, and, and, and you see here the accumulation of consent, because usually someone has consented to the data becoming available, and then they are somewhere in the database and then used as training data. So let's say for the development of the AI-driven system, there is also some, let's say, accumulation of consents, and then again, the application of the system on you as a patient is again a consent. Um, and I, then I, I, I really start worrying. Um, and you can, you can witness already from the comment that Chris uh, already referred to, and also the, let's say, the underlying discussion on Article 22, that the GDPR in itself was not fully prepared to, um, uh, let's say, the neural network type of AI and the, the autonomous AI development that we also talk about today. Um, um, but let's say, uh, from the legal political perspective, you usually uh, hesitate a bit to say you should add an amendment to regulation because sometimes it leads to uh, be careful what you ask because you may not like what you get, right? So in, in that way, you can say, if we can deal with the proper prop, uh, with the common uh, current framework, and uh, a sort of an, an AI informed development uh, by the national courts, as well as by the European Court of Justice, that may, in the end of the day, bring us a same quality of law than a better regulation on a, on a European level. Okay, I'm, we're pretty much out of time, but I'm just going to allow Paul a quick comment on that, if you because you, you actually highlight the GDPR in this context. No, I what think I think the answer. I would agree to this. You know, I would really have to understand very precisely which problem uh, we need to solve with new law before making a new law. <laughs> I mean, it took ages, you know, six years to get this through. I think it's a, a good idea to try to solve issues within the law. And uh, my advice is it's, um, you know, we had over nearly 4,000 amendments to uh, the text proposed by the commission in the European parliament. And uh, I'm very relaxed about uh, things which on first sight look a little bit unclear in the text here and there, because there's a very simple rule in the EU law, which is if the secondary law is unclear, look to the primary law. And we have a very good provision on data protection rights in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And so I would say whenever you have doubts, and I heard the doubts of uh, Professor Henkin on, you know, whether these information rights can apply to um, 
uh, to neural networks. Uh, um, um, I think, you know, when you look at the purpose of the law, it was definitely uh, the intention of the lawmaker to make a technology neutral law. That's why you don't find the buzzwords of the day in the text. And this also means that we have to interpret the text ever new with new technologies. But it was not the, um, the um, uh, intention of the legislator to create a law which has carve outs for a technology because the word doesn't fit exactly. So, you know, um, my advice would be interpret, for example, the information rights, but any other provision always anew to give it relevance to the new technology and new business model at hand. And that will solve most of the problems. And if it doesn't give me a call, I'm always happy to help on this. Issue. Yeah. Well, there is more questions actually on the GDPR coming in and, uh, and actually other topics as well. I think a couple of you addressed through the chat, but we are actually now out of time. We're over time. Uh, so we will have to uh, end it there, but hopefully maybe we can answer some of those